Hi, I'm Constance Mears. Welcome to the Strategic Authorpreneur Podcast, where we'll be talking today about the intersection between your vision and your values in your business practices. Hey there, strategic authorpreneurs. I'm Crystal Hunt. And I'm Michela Mitrani. We are here to help you save time, money, and energy as you level up your writing career. Welcome to episode 12 of the Strategic Authorpreneur Podcast. On today's show, we're talking with special guest Constance Mears about the challenge of leveling up your creative business while staying in alignment with your values. So first of all, we're going to take a quick little detour and we're going to talk about what each of us has been up to in this past week and uh, share with you the most helpful resources and things that we have discovered. So my fine Italian friend, what have you been up to? Let's do this. So I've noticed that it has become a kind of tradition for me to suggest at least a book and I don't want to break that tradition uh, for now. So today, I'm going to suggest you another short but lovely read uh, that I found uh, very useful. Um, the book is called Strangers to Super Fans, Super Fans, and is from David Gogran. I really hope I'm not butchering his name. Um, and I'm going to be very, very short on why I'm suggesting you this book. It's the first book ever that I've seen an author describing from top to bottom what is the journey of a reader. So every single book that I've read so far, it's always 100% from the perspective of the author or the writer. But this one, this one, I found it super insightful because it's really like, uh, it's a probe inside the reader's mind. And uh, there are some steps that the readers uh, undergo before finding your book and then finding you. And I believe, Crystal, once you understand this kind of step by step, which if I'm not mistaken, are like five steps in the, in the book described by David, you basically, you understand how people purchase this book and you can take actionable decision on how to change your cover, change the back matter, the internal matter. It's like really a flip side, a turning of the page from you, author, to the reader. So... I really, 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 really liked them. It's very short and uh, it's written in a very endearing way. Do you say endearing? Like funny also? Uh, yeah, endearing is like when it makes you like somebody. I like this uh, guy. I yeah. like him. Really. So <laughs> yeah. I really like him. Good word him. choice. Yeah. And uh, I think like it wouldn't take, I think I read it in like a couple of sittings. And uh, after that, uh, one of my rules is like, uh, if I come out from a book knowing one new thing, I'm good. Like uh, the, the money I spent are completely worth it. I think I've learned 100 different things after reading Strangers to Superfan, which subtitle is a marketing guide to the reader journey. So that was my resource. I don't know if you have something on uh, that line, but really this book was good. Yeah, I love that book. It's one of my staples that I recommend to everybody. Um, it's I also used it to reverse engineer the failure cycle. When you're talking about where do people fall out of your sales funnel, um, I found that book to be really, really helpful when I was trying to look at, okay, where do I need to make changes to keep people following along through my, my process as I'm an author. And I, I really like how direct he is into the point and how, um, yeah, just how much is packed into that little book. So it's, it's very concise information, which is fantastic. So I would highly recommend that to anybody who hasn't read it yet. Um, I have been reading a book called Let Go by Pat Flynn, and I don't have a physical copy, but I do have the digital copy. So you can see there. Um, and that one, it right at this very moment is free actually he's got a promo on but it may be back to being paid by the time you are watching this but you can check the show notes we'll have links to any of the resources that we recommend during the episode underneath the episode on our website at strategicauthorpreneur.com and the this book by pat is let me read the subtitle for you 
It is how to transform moments of panic into a life of profits and purpose. So Pat takes a deep dive into what happened when he lost his job originally. Uh, he used to work for an architecture firm and it tells the story of him switching from that to going into online business and how that all evolved. And he's done an updated version of it as well. So taking the original content and done some reflections. I'm only about halfway through, so I can't tell you about the second half yet. So no spoilers, mm -hmm. but it, it has been really interesting just in looking at my own business processes and seeing, you know, one of the things I love about Pat Flynn is he's always very clear about where things didn't go right or where he would have done things differently and uh, very good at asking questions to kind of get you thinking about how to apply that in your own business. So I worked through some of the questions that were linked from one of the sections this morning and, and really just applied some of that to our current situation because everything is changing in the world right now due to the COVID-19 situation and people being forced into working from home and a lot of industry shifts. So I think it's, it's as relevant as ever it was in terms of helping people to work through a bit of a, a business evolution where you're needing to transform what your business used to look like to what it's going to look like now. So I have been using that as a little bit of a handbook and would highly recommend it. It's also very approachably written. Um, it's like having a conversation with Pat Flynn and or listening to the podcast. If you've done that before, uh, it's always a good experience. So I would highly recommend checking that out. And on that note, another thing I would recommend you check out is our interview that follows with Constance Mears. And our special guest today is an artist, a writer, and a mystic. And I've known her for I think about five years now, but one of the things I have always admired most about Constance is her ability to live in her values, even when it is not convenient, not comfortable, and not the easy way to take. And so she has made a lot of choices in how she's developed her author business and how she's developed and shared her products and her knowledge and is very intentional in keeping her choices within what she believes is her mission and her vision. So um, without further ado, we'll give that a listen and then we will see you after so we can break it all down and talk about it. Today, we are talking about alignment between your vision and your values in your business practices. And so I thought that Constance would be an excellent person to talk to about this because I have had a front row seat watching her navigate the publishing world and some of this creative stuff along the way and kind of making decisions about what feels like a good fit and what doesn't and have just been very impressed with how you have navigated that. So I thought it, we could have a little conversation here and just talk about how that worked for you and some of the challenges you came across along the way and kind of how you found solutions to those in a way that resonated well for you. So maybe you could start with a little introduction for folks who don't know you quite as well as I do yet and just let them know a bit about kind of who you are and what you do. Well, it's taken me quite a bit of time to kind of claim uh, my title, um, to, to sort of narrow down the choices of, of who I wanted to become in this um, life uh, lifetime. And I've, I've narrowed it down to three, uh, artist, writer, and mystic. Uh, and all three of them are, are pretty low on the economic scale. <laughs> generally speaking, in our culture. So um, <clears throat> from my point of view, um, monetary compensation is not as high as um, doing something with meaning. Um, and, and even in, in the artwork that I do, um, there's different kinds of artists. There's some who are just, you know, they, they pick a style and they go for it. And it really is a business. And for me, it has always been, oh, I, I hate to use the word ministry or, I mean, it's just sacred to me. And, and I think that's been my biggest um, juxt or not juxt uh, conundrum, <laughs> uh, we're a juxtaposition working out um, between making a living 
um, in the real world, but then also, um, you know, uh, adhering to my values, which right. many are otherworldly. So <laughs> the, the train does not always uh, meet, uh, unfortunately. And and I've experienced this from the very beginning. Um, and, and it's not unique to me. I think every creative person uh, throughout time has had to deal with how to fund their creative uh, aspirations. And, and in the old days, they had um, patrons, you know, people who would support them through, you know, long expanses. However, there's always that trade-off. <laughs> it doesn't, those, that money doesn't come without strings. And so you're funded, you're well-funded, but mm, you don't necessarily get to um, choose the subject matter or, or the you know, style-wise. Generally, they choose you because the style. But so it's that, uh, you know, that search for freedom, express, uh, uh, creative expression and freedom in that. And then also just, you know, keeping the lights on so you can, you know, uh, see your paints, see your colors. And, and for writing, it's the same thing. Um, you know, uh, we've gone from the publishing world where there were gatekeepers and, and just a few got through and, and they supported you fully. And you can make a living back, you know, I, I, I'd say 20 years ago, maybe 25, uh, right about <laughs> right about the... Uh, introduction of um, the Macintosh and desktop publishing, um, and it opened the world. It was it's more democratic now. Any any person can can fund themselves somehow, and and get their their work out into the world. And so that changes the the playing field quite a bit, um, but it doesn't change the fact that you still have to fund it with um, real world dollars. Right. And I think it puts us as creatives, it puts us into an interesting role as business owners when our inclination might not be that. So, you know, the independence and, and options are there, but it does hand you another hat that you have to wear as you're going through your creative process of how, if and how will I monetize this? And, you know, what options do I have as far as payment processing and all of these kind of tools evaluations start to become part of the process. And then, and then we go looking for help because that's not necessarily our background or our training as artists to suddenly be business people. And so I think there's some interesting things that we discover when we go out looking for help with growing our small creative businesses into something larger. So maybe can you talk a little bit about what, what were the things you were finding when you went to go look at how do I monetize my creativity? Well, I guess I'll switch to, since I know a lot of um, your viewers, your listeners are, are um, inclined toward writing, uh, I'll switch to when I started writing a memoir um, and, and deciding about whether I was going to self-publish or try to pitch it to, to a publishing company. And it was so, you know, it's a memoir. It was so personal that I, I was reluctant to give away um, some of the uh, creative freedom um, or creative rights, I guess. <laughs> uh, they can change the title. They can, you know, have you change endings. And uh, the subject matter was pretty far off the mainstream. So I didn't want to compromise uh, the message in order to get it out. And, and I know that in, in the <clears throat> landscape that we, in publishing that we deal with now, the, the key word or the, the buzzword is platform, building your platform. So, so even going to a publisher without that platform, the, the work can be stellar. But um, if, if they are a business and if they don't think that they can move that product, <laughs> they, they won't um, buy in. So. And I, you know, my um, influences, I guess, are are off the beaten path. Um, in in the old days, and I'm talking about old old religion, Roman religion, you know, prior to uh, Christianity, even uh, I, I guess pagan uh, uh, earth based religions, they had um, temples out in the middle of nowhere, and then surrounding that. Um, temple was a space sometimes it was a sacred grove and sometimes it was a big meadow and it's called a phantom 
And uh, that's what I love is that in order to get to the holy place, you have to go through the phantom. And the people that um, hung out, <clears throat> excuse me, hung out in the air, that area were called fanatics. And that's where we get the term fan um, in our, our common culture, our, our vernacular. Um, you know, they talk about get 10 or a thousand raving fans or whatever, fanatics essentially. And so for me, I tune into that and say, okay, what is the message? Am I leading readers to the holy place? <laughs> you know, to me, if, if we're moving people at a really deep level, then I figure, or who, whoever is um, pulled to that holy place is going to have to come through me, at least that particular, you know, um, place. There's, there's so many, there's so many voices out there um, who can lead you to a deeper place. But th that was my primary goal. And so, you know, whether or not it, it paid off, it wasn't, wasn't so much um, my highest concern. Um, I did decide to go self-publishing and the lucky thing, I guess lucky, I don't know, um, is I have a lot of the skills. I, I, I design my own book cover and I do layout for, for other people's books. So I was able, I had a lot of tools myself. Um, I turned to um, uh, you actually for, uh, for some of the strategy um, uh, pieces. I, um, turned to a, a common friend of ours, Amanda Bidnall, for editing. So I made sure that it was polished. I, I think that I think that was the sort of the trade-off when anyone could publish anything that a lot of, you know, um, subpar uh, work got out there and flooded the market. So now the job is to help people, you know, identify where the good work is. So we're so uh, I don't know if that answered your, your question very directly. <laughs> you, you were probably tuned into more. What are the tools? And you know, I, I use Asana to help me. You know, no, no, it's not. Yeah. It's not really about that at all. It's it's more. I think, you know, you. I mean, your memoir is called the Bumbling Mystic's Obituary, and you know who who you are. You describe yourself as an an artist and a mystic and you know, all of these things, they, they don't immediately say like corporate processes. You know, that's not a, that's not right. an instant match. And so if we look at who, who you are as a person, you talked earlier about your values, not necessarily being in alignment or what you value, not necessarily being in alignment with that business culture, but maybe you could just elaborate a little bit, like what are the things that you do place value on? Well, definitely meaning and, and authenticity. Um, and, and here's what, you know, part of my discovery was that there are people out there who are publishing books about very deep and meaningful things. You know, Bre Brene Brown, for instance. Um, Gabby Bernstein is another one that I admire. And at some point, I have discovered that I don't have that sort of front man, front woman type personality. It, it takes a lot. I'm an INFP, if you get into Myers-Briggs um, typology. And, uh, you know, the I part, the introvertedness is like 90%. I mean, I'm an extreme in that uh, realm. So I felt like in some ways I was swimming against the current a lot in trying to, or, or I felt like I was trying to be larger than life, larger than, you know, um, who I was in it. Uh, and, I, and I had that same feeling when I was doing the art, uh, p doing more painting as well, trying to get your name out there. I feel like it's always, you know, sort of uh, puffery. I, I, I don't know. Um, but then, uh, you know, I've, I've been uh, contemplating a lot. You could, you could see that my mind process right now I can't hide it is is I'm a contemplative mystic so I think the modern term is overthinker maybe I don't know what uh, I, I think about the meanings and, and the whys and, and and the you know the, the deeper slant to it rather than um, more the strategy and, and yet I, I so um, appreciate uh, a lot of the help that you know you gave me in, in particular 
um, oh, in fact, um, in the Bumbling Mystics obituary, I listed you as the book coach because I honestly don't think that I, I could have gotten through that entire process without um, some really specific guidance on the nuts and bolts parts of it. I, I had a mission. I had a vision of, of, you know, the story that I wanted, that I felt needed to be out there that could help people uh, navigate um, this crazy world <laughs> and get to the end and not regret, dang, why didn't I go for, you know, why didn't I go for it? Yeah. Why was I always, you know, trying to, why was I always living someone else's version of, of my life? So. Yeah. Um, again, circular. Um, I don't think I answered your question very, very directly. <laughs> it's a winding road to wisdom. It, it's all good. <laughs> so I think an interesting next question is just one thing I noticed like out there, you're, you know, okay, I'm going to be strategic about this business side of things and I'm going to learn about sales funnels and I'm going to learn about, you know, email list building and I am going to build an audience and I'm going to write sales copy and all of these things. So for a lot of writers out there who are with you on the introvert scale um, and also just not loving marketing as a thing and, and feeling when what you're marketing is something that you created from your own self, I think that's extra hard because the more people who see it, the more exposed you feel. So oh, there's that too. let's talk for a second. I mean, your, your book is your story. I mean, you've got multiple books, but the Bumbling Mystics Obituary is about your life. And so yeah, I'd be curious to hear what kind of challenges you found with marketing that book kind of inside yourself or, mm -hmm. or in the context of that business stuff? Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, challenges is a, a good word, umbrella word for that. Uh, so I, I think I have to reveal just a little bit that um, I'm in the book, I'm predicting, I, I had a premonition of my death. And so I'm outlining that, which is out of the mainstream kind of, you know, process of, of the, the dance between life and death. Uh, and so I feel like if, if it doesn't, you know, until the day that, or until it happens, it's really speculative and, you know, could just be the ravings of a, a crazy woman, essentially, um, who's had a little too much time alone. Uh, <laughs> and yet, if I, if I hits, I mean, I, I've put, I'm all in, let's, let's say that that's a, a gambling turn where you just, you, I'm, I'm investing it all. Um, for for a, a specific purpose, not just recklessly, but to help people realize that um, we can interact with the other realm in this realm. And, and I don't think that's a message we get very often, unless it's really compacted in, in the um, uh, structure of religion. But I, I'm just talking about any normal person, just a direct connection and that's what the, the terminology for mystic or, or the definition for mystic is M my definition anyway <laughs> so in terms of um so i'm reluctant to uh you know blast it out there i f i feel like well, i guess one of my um favorite books is the alchemist um and and it did not sell well at when he published it in fact, I think it had sold a hundred copies for you know many years, and then someone found it, and I, I think it might have even been Madonna who mentioned it on Oprah, and then it just blew up. I feel like I have planted a seed. I guess this is not business terminology, no <laughs> bullet points. This is not a funnel. I feel like I planted a seed. I did the work that I was I was called to do, and what becomes of it isn't necessarily my work. I do have to, I have put it out on, on the interwebs. Um, I'm not, you know, hiding it. What's the term? Hiding it under a bushel. I'm not hiding it or hiding it in a drawer. That's what, you know, I mean, that's the, the literary. Under know. the bed. Yeah. The manuscript yeah. under the bed is a recurring <laughs> theme for people who've written something that they're just not quite, it's not quite ready to be out in the world. 
or they're not quite ready for it to be out in the world. And, and I get that for sure. I mean, it is exposure to the maximum. And um, as kind of a weirdo, you know, just someone with some, you know, not a little offbeat um, thinking, uh, you know, I hid, I hid that aspect of myself for a really long time. So to be so public about this and that, and I, I unveil a lot of my uh, big mistakes in life. And I, I, I felt like if I didn't tell the, the whole truth, that I would be less uh, believable when I tell some pretty extremely incredible stories. So I, I took that risk of, you know, kind of exposing me as a human being. I mean, I, I, oh, funny. I was going to say, well, I haven't killed anybody. That's kind of a low bar, isn't it? Um, <laughs> and, you know, there may be people who have killed somebody and, and it's still redeemable. So I, I kind of want to get off that the, the judgment wheel. I'm sorry. I've, I've diverted into a wild tangent. As I do. <laughs> Uh these things do happen (laughs) (laughs) yeah I think oh go ahead I was gonna say I think I think you bring up an interesting point though like you you said earlier that you know um authenticity and vulnerability are kind of themes for you and they're they're built into your work they're built into the way you approach your business model as well and in terms of the things you choose to do or not do you aren't necessarily walking the beaten path that is what everyone else has done, but you're choosing things along the way that fit with your vision and your values. So, you know, I think there's value for people in that, just hearing the fact that you, you, you decide what's important in your publishing journey, which was telling your story, planting the seed, making a thing that's going to last you know, if you're, if you're right yeah. about this, if that vision is true, that will last beyond you. And so you right. are basically just building a legacy. And I think that's what all writers are doing, whether they're consciously addressing that or not, they are taking their thoughts and their experiences and their ideas, and they're putting them into a format that will outlive them. And so that yeah. is an interesting way to build a legacy. Um yeah. So, so what I'm curious, and I know because I know you, I know a few things from your background that I think have kind of set you up in a really interesting way to do this work. So, or if you're willing to talk a little bit, I know that you wrote obituaries for a while. Oh. Um, and, and so I would love just to, for you to talk a little bit about like, how did that inform how things developed for you on the publishing side and you know how you chose to frame your life story the way you did. Yes. And and I I guess I'll I'll even go back a little bit further. <laughs> I didn't go to uh you know writing school. I didn't uh <clears throat> I didn't even go to art school actually. I I had been um trying to be known as an artist for probably 5 years. And I was at a midlife point and I decided to do a vision quest. I mean, literally go to the mountains for four days and fast. And um, I recognized that I'd been given some gifts like talents toward communication of ideas and imagination. And I guess ideas that are beyond um, what's, what, what's accepted now. I think they're, I'm, I'm, Visionary, for, for lack of a better word, which means, um, oh, I just heard a great Oscar Wilde uh, quote of, you know, those who just look at the moon. Um, no, I'm going to butcher it. Never mind. Uh, just that uh, the ideas that I, that I propose aren't necessarily accepted at this time, but I feel like it's the edge of where we're evolving to or where we could evolve to. Maybe that's a better way. So while I'm up in the mountains, uh, I get this message that uh, it was, if you're going to be a writer, you need to. And I hadn't even intended to, to follow that as a path. I, I you know, had intended to be doing painting. And at the moment I heard that, I, then I looked back on my life and recognized that writing had been there all along. I mean, even from when I was a, one of my first memories was picking up a pen and just the power of, you know, I realized that 
you know, my mom could take a piece of paper that had these word, you know, writing on it, and she would know what to get in, in this at the store, or or she would know how to make a cake. I mean, it had so much power to it. And I wanted to understand, I mean, another quote of just the, how um, writing is sort of like creating a spell. It, it's uh, the, the words have power. It's, it's, it can be entertaining, but you can also like help form reality through ideas. I mean, no, nothing in this world has been created without having the idea of it first. So, I mean, that, that is the power of the world to create is, is ideas. So. I like that realm and I've liked yeah. that realm from the beginning. <laughs> so, um, so during this vision quest, I get a message that, that writing is what I had come for. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Um, so then right after that, I had been working um, for the newspaper doing the graphic design for the newspaper. Um, and I've been doing that for quite some time. And somehow within, I don't know, three months, I think of that, maybe even less, a, a job, uh, yeah, job opened up on the writing side. And newspapers are really um, particular about crossing over that line of, you know, creating advertising to then, you know, telling stories or, or not telling stories, but um, imparting information. I mean, that's, and there's a, uh, advertising is persuasive uh, information. And then the editorial side is just imparting the truth as, as objectively as you can see it. So. Um, and that job uh, was where I learned how to write obituaries. And I was fascinated by the choices that people make. I mean, I, I just have a curious mind. So it was like, wow, um, you know, just so many um, different paths that people took. And, and you know, I'm set, not second guessing, but curious, you know, they majored in music, and, but now they're an insurance salesman. How did that happen? And, and what were the compromises that they made, you know? And that's, that is the, um, what we have to navigate as creative people is how to hold on to that spark of, of our creative ambition, if you will, um, to, to the purest degree. <laughs> I might have taken it a little too far. And, and, and the, the downside of that, if, if you will, is, you know, I, um, kind of skated poverty level for you know most of my life not an you know I, the buzzword is always six figures you know that seems to be the the, the bar that um makes you successful or makes you you know want to post on facebook more or whatever uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, sure sure uh, and and there have been um expanses of my life where i did do you know corporate work or work that was less satisfying i always found a creative you know aspect of it a lot of graphic design a lot of um publishing type work uh, still still writing still playing with colors and composition but uh for the but it didn't have the meaning that is so important to me um so right. so it looks it looks creative on the outside and it, and it pays the bills so there's that um, but there, there was a deep place in my soul that was just like, oh, really? Are you going to get to the end? And, and you never, you know, really went for it. Um, so that had been, you know, sort of uh, bubbling up or, or percolating for quite some time. Yeah. So, so let's just dial back one bit there. So you had said something that kind of caught my attention, which was, you know, all these people posting about six figures and blah, blah, blah. And like the Facebook world, like that reality is kind of what we're seeing is what people are choosing to post on social. And the people who are posting those things there are generally doing it with an agenda, right? They're usually selling a course or they're selling some sort of training thing that will help you get to six figures as well. But if getting to six figures is not your end goal, then the methods that they're teaching you are not going to be necessarily in alignment. There might be some useful things in there, but mm -hmm. if that isn't your raison d'etre, so that's not what you're all about, then mm -hmm. it, it makes those things that they're telling you to do feel very uncomfortable and in opposition to the authenticity part, which is interesting. 
Oh, not for the lack of trying. Oh my gosh, I tried to shoehorn my foot into that glass slipper and it did not fit. I just couldn't do it. I couldn't push the button of, you know, cha-ching. And, and you know, I've, I've been looking at that really at a deep level, um, you know, Jungian type shadow work of what is it about that transactional um, relationship in terms of speaking to someone's soul i mean that that's the level that i want to interact with people in or at and something about it being transactional bothers me at a really deep level and yet i see six people successful at it uh, i know that it's resolvable and yet i just personally couldn't do it and um at this moment, I'm in a cycle where I'm, I'm kind of stepping away and, and easing up on asking my, um, oh, I guess, mystical, the, the, the soul-focused part, not to have to pay the bills, not to be the cash cow. I, I can still um, be that in the world and express that in different ways without, you know, um, the barcode. <laughs> It's such black and white terms. I know that there's some some deep psychological block that I haven't uh, worked through, or this is just who I am at a very deep level, and and I I'm gonna claim a victory. Uh, so this is my type of success, I guess, because I haven't buckled uh, at this point, and I not for lack of trying. I have. Try to weasel under that fence. Um, you know, who, who doesn't, you know, want all the, the goodies and the accolades and, and all that. But um, if, I, if I have to, you know, it's like chopping off an arm or something. I'm just like, uh, uh, it just feels like too big of a sacrifice. I, I don't know. Uh, that's not helpful to, to you know, your listeners, I'm sure, in the real world. Uh, yeah, it, I, I make compromises. Oh, well, I guess one of the other aspects of my life that have allowed me to do this is I have some sort of gift of manifestation. So I am able to, like, out of the blue, get situations that just drop in my lap that absolutely fit. The, the the desires that I've had, um, what I what I need, not, not necessarily oh, it's the Rolling Stones, not everything you want, but definitely what I need, um, and it's all tax free. <laughs> not all of it, but you know, uh, um, you know, situations that work in your favor that are not in the um, mainstream economy. Let's put it that way: a gifting barter that type of thing. Like maybe I don't want to be publishing this out to the world. Uh, but I, you know, I'm a creative uh, thinker, so, uh, you know, I can do a run around that also. And, and I feel like, um, yeah, there aren't that many venues for a woman in particular, woman mystic. You know, we've got the patriarchal religions. There aren't that many, you know, ways for a woman to express a, a deep spirituality that is not necessarily gender based, but but also uh, recognizes the sacredness of the feminine. Uh, I'm getting a little off, yeah. off point here, but, but yeah. I think what what you said it really does make sense, and there is a lot of value in people remembering that what they have to offer has value, even if it's not attached to a dollar sign. So yes. you know when we talk about bartering, you know, there's this like, it's kind of like, eh, should I talk about that? Will I get in trouble? Um, but bartering is a legitimate economy. You can trade favors with friends for anything um, at any time. There's no rules against that, right? So I think there is a lot of value. And what we tell people to do in their startup phase is to try and keep your overhead low and your costs low. And, you know, if you have a day job, like you're a graphic designer as a day job and you can trade, maybe you meet somebody who needs their book. Um, they need a cover for their book, but you know, you need editing for your book. You can trade that you can trade those skills. And then that helps everybody move forward quicker than they would have been able to had they had to have that dollar figure in their bank account. So, you know, there are a few things you cannot barter for, <laughs> for sure. There's some stuff that actually requires the exchange of cash. Yeah. But there are various ways to go about 
raising that cash. And, and I think, you know, when you're talking about people who were an insurance salesman, but were passionate about their music and they played in the symphony orchestra and that's really what they lived for. Like their job was to pay for the rest of their life. That does yeah. not make them necessarily less happy. And I, I think that's one of the things that, that happens when we take our passion and we turn it into a business it becomes a lot more pressure on it. And we do have to make choices in different ways than we would if that's what our sole income stream depends on. And so I know myself for sure, and lots of the other creatives that I've talked to have made very specific choices about not actually switching to full time too soon or, or right away, or for some people even at all, that, 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 that their strategy of keeping their creative freedom is that they don't have to put that much financial pressure on it. And I think this isn't something that we hear about those people selling the courses and people talking about their six figure incomes. They did make that jump and they are for the most part dependent on it. Or maybe those numbers actually include a lot of other side hustles they have, but they're just not saying that. Like a lot of people say, Oh yeah, I make six figures as an author you know, and I could say that, but my consulting is what brings in a good amount of that. And my nonfiction sales brings in a good amount of that. And the workshops and conferences I teach at is another income stream. And my fiction, you know, it, it does decently well, but it's not the thing that is paying for my entire lifestyle. I also have a patron of the arts. <laughs> um, so, you know, my husband kicks in as well. So there's, there's all of these things that go in the mix. And so you can say, well, I'm a full-time creative, but the back end of that looks completely different for different people. And, yeah. you know, I think that that's, we don't talk about that as much as we maybe need to, because it creates these expectations that I should be able to do this or I have failed. And I, I know yeah. that's very, very challenging. So yeah, I would just be interested, um, yeah, to talk a little bit about that. Like, what is that like navigating through other people's expectations and the Facebook life that we see? Yeah, well, and I think, you know, monetizing, uh, distilling things to a commodity or, or a dollar figure is a handy way to help measure. And yet, <clears throat> I think it, it um, leads to a, often a competitive or comparative uh, relationship with other creatives. You know, you, you know, eye somebody who's on there and it's like, wow, they're, you know, <laughs> they're doing, you know, so well, why am I struggling? Um, and yet I think there are, are broader definitions of wealth. Um, personally, I'd rather have, you know, break bread, literally only have enough to, to share bread. But if the table is full with a bunch of creative people who are talking about ideas and, you know, what they're working on and, and that life force, I'm an introvert, so I don't have very many of those parties, but, uh, that, uh, what I'm saying is there are other things besides having, you know, the fancy car and, and what a hundred figure, I don't even know what I would spend a hundred figure or uh, uh, six figures on, but, um, <laughs> oh, actually we, I've been playing a game, uh, with, with a group, uh, that it, it explores that I, I've been, I've been looking at this issue from so many different directions, trying to kind of piece it together and, um, and I may, I may get to the end and still not have figured it out. But I, but I'm, I, I still hold fast to that uh, the, the mystery of it, the um, contemplation of it, the holding it as important is a pathway. But, uh, maybe you don't ever come to any, you know, surefire conclusion that then I can sell to other people going, I figured it out, you know, um, I haven't figured it out. So, you know, I have nothing to package with bullet points or, or whatever, but I feel like the, the um, path that I have taken is so authentic and rich uh, and <laughs> interesting. Um you know, in not having resources, sometimes we're dependent on um, providence and and 
uh, you know, I, I've, I've been um, privileged to experience things that I probably wouldn't if, if I followed what it says on the dollar. It says in God we trust, but um, the people who have the most dollars, it's, that's the opposite. If, if they really believed in, in a power that is benevolent and is like as benevolent as nature is, I mean, nature is like super abundant. I mean, if you look at one tomato and how many seeds are in that one tomato, and then how many of tomatoes are on one bush, I mean, it's just, it's incredible, it's mind blowing when you think about it. Um, and yet, when you get into the, the dollar, if you define wealth by, by sheer dollars, this paper, and it's a construct, it's, it's really not even, it's not even based on, you know, real value. So it's, it's super yeah. subjective. I think it's really interesting looking at um, wealth and the idea of money because money is never about money. Like everybody has these super strong sort of visceral reactions to money. It's fascinating when you look at why um, relationships break up or people fight or mm -hmm. whatever. It, money is one of the most common reasons, actually. And mm -hmm. and money is never about money. Money is energy you can use to make other things happen. It's the things we make happen that are where that conflict comes from. But I, I think one thing like you can say, oh, well, you know, I've I've not really hit that abundance. But if you look at what the average person owes, like the debt ratio for most people, I believe it's about $250,000 and they're averaging out um, everyone. So like some people are way higher than that. And I, I think that includes mortgages, but, but if you like average the amount of debt by the population, it's, it's about, and I'm going to have to check this figure, but my, my brain is telling me it was around $250,000. It was high enough that I remember feeling physically sick when I saw the number yeah. Um, and just thinking like, oh, wow. Okay. So even if that is your mortgage, which makes sense. I mean, around where I live, um, an apartment costs usually between about 400 and a million and something dollar, like 400,000 and a million something, a house you pretty much can't buy for like less than $750,000 in this, this area where I live. Um, so like all of Vancouver kind of area, we're known for our expensive housing for those of you out there listening and feeling horrible. It's, it's very beautiful, beautiful here yeah. and, um, <laughs> very expensive. So I think it's, it's interesting to think about that, that, that well, all of these people we see living in abundance may actually owe three or four or five times the amount of what their income is. And so yeah. Is it more abundant to live beyond your means or to leverage the incoming current dollars against your future? Or is it more abundant to actually live with what you have and make choices that do not put you in debt? Um, so I, I don't know. I think that has to be factored in. If we're talking about authenticity and realness and, you mm -hmm. know, actually examining the hard truths of some things. I think that as a, a business person and as an author, I mean, so many people are willing to leverage their current life for what is a possible income stream in the future. And so I know I harp on this a little bit because I've been one of those people who did that and then paid the price um, mm -hmm. is just making choices that don't mortgage your future self's freedom, <laughs> basically, as we mm -hmm. go into these decisions. And I think you have you've been very creative about how you've done your publishing business and you have not incurred any debt to do that, which is an, I think a very, um, that that's a, a very hard thing to do. And I think you've, you've done that amazingly well, but I just think it's, it's a good thing for people to be aware of that that is possible to do and, you know, something to shoot for. Yeah. And I take it for granted, actually, because I've been doing it for so long. 20 years ago, 20 years ago, really, name probably to the day, uh, I decided I didn't want to be in debt. I, I felt so locked in from, you know, uh, into the future, mortgaged, uh, essentially. And, it, and I didn't even have a house, but the, the debt alone, and it wasn't that much, you know. But for me, it felt like, 
I, would, I might need to compromise choices. And, and so for my value system, staying out of that um, I mean, the prison is the word that, that keeps coming. Yeah. And that's dramatic, but that's how it feels. But debtor's prison is a real thing, right? Like that was a real place. And it's, it's a metaphorical place too. Uh, and I think it's it's a metaphorical place for how people feel. They're not they're not locked behind bars, but they're locked in a cubicle often that they don't want to be in. Um, but they made choices uh, prior. So for twenty years, I've lived, I've lived with no debt, no credit card, which means I I um, have learned to live within my means. And I know for a lot of people, they're, they're aghast at that. Uh, they can't even fathom what that looks like. Um, it, it just resonates more truly with my value system. That, that, that was, and that's a big choice. It does limit what I'm able to get sometimes. Sometimes I have to, you know, work with something funky for a while. Um, it's not the worst thing in the world, I got to tell you. Um, when you look at the, the lifestyle that we enjoy in, in Western culture, that's, that's a huge um, a generalization and uh, I'm, I'm already regretting saying it, but uh, just the, the um, yeah, the li lifestyle, the, the benefits that we have. I mean, if, if you have hot water running out of your tap and, and food on your table and, and friends and you know, there's so much more to life than, than a square footage. I, I just, uh, I'd, I'd rather, I, I feel the same way about life. In fact, I'd rather go for a juicy compact life that, that is, that has so much gusto. Than, I'm not going for longevity. Let's put it that way. I'm going for meaning. And, and so, um, you know, there's a saying as within, so without. So I think what our values are re really does reflect out in, in how we live our life. And, and you can, you know, justify it rationally, but at some level, there's a subconscious desire to, to play it out the way that, that we do. And I love that, that we're, we're free to make those choices. And uh, I, I, I'm not even going to say suffer the consequences. I live the consequences. Of, of choices that I make. Um, and I could have done a bigger splash. I could have been, done a big launch, you know, when I, when I put my book out, but I'd rather, oh, I, you know, I'd rather have, and this is what's happened actually. People will read it and go, oh my gosh, you know, I'll get an email. Of, Thank you for writing that. It, you know, it touches them in some place and then they buy it or, or, you know, share it with somebody else. And I'd, I'd rather have it trickle out that way in an organic way. Um, you know, that's not, that's not the road to riches for sure. But, um, to, you know, to me, it, it resonates with, with my um, desire for meaning and authenticity. Well, and I think you're not building a sales funnel, you're building a movement. Like, you know, your, your book, as much as it's about you, isn't really about you. It's about drawing people's attention to the fact that we don't have all of the time. You know, yeah. a, a lot of other things are renewable. Time, not so much. We we have what we have, and we don't know exactly how much that's going to be. And so, yep. you know, making our choices now as if we don't have all the time in the world is a very valuable exercise. And and I think, you know, sort of that is the legacy that comes with the Bumbling Mystics obituary. So now that we've piqued all of your curiosity, um, where can people find that book if they want to go read it? Well, my first choice would be for them to go to their local bookstore and ask for it <laughs> because I, I love that um, sort of uh, human scale economy. Um, of course, it's available also on Amazon. Um, I think it's even available as an ebook on my website, but um, <laughs> the fact that I don't know that and I don't have, uh, you know, the, the, that strong call for action. It's so funny. I mean, I studied um sales funnels oh every you know from every angle and i get the psychology of it i, t I totally do um there was a there was a quote that i had when i was writing that said don't be a, a writer who needs readers be the kind of writer that readers need like like focus I really on like what, that i do too and the focus on 
I feel like from the publishing, the, the commercial end of it, or the business end of it is about, you know, getting the, those readers, you know, um, volume. And I'm, I'm not about volume, I'm about depth, I guess. And, and you know, I'd rather reach three people and, and have it be something that they keep turning back to when they have a big choice in their life and, and go, okay, I can do this differently. And my hope is that when they get to the end of their life, they do not have a regret that they did not go for that soulful path um, and, and, take, and do the short change or uh, uh, sh um, short term, you know, uh, vision that, that they went for, the vision that's going to get them closer to who they uh, can be or who they came here to be, essentially. So. Yeah. Okay. So speaking of uh, yeah. making choices and branching points and everything else, I have one challenging question for you to wrap up with, which is, if you could get in a time machine and you could travel back to any period in your life <laughs> and give yourself a piece of advice, when would you go? Um, and, and what would you say as far as like helping mm -hmm. your current creative self become what you need to become? You know, I, I think it's pretty easy. There, there were quite a few turning points that, you know, one decision either way really could uh, change the trajectory. But I think way from the beginning, uh, when I was 13, I, I took off to the mountains, like 80 miles from my house to go contemplate the meaning of life. I've been this <laughs> my whole life, right? Yeah, this is not a shtick. This is, this is who I am. And I was so lost because, I, you know, who does that? that I was so out of step with my family that I had no sense of belonging. And, you know, if you look at Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs, that belonging is right in the middle and you can't go for your dreams until you figure out that piece. And it took so long. I mean, uh, one of the archetypal uh, stories that I really resonate with is the ugly duckling uh, of just really suppressing that, that mystic side of me uh, because it was not accepted and, and, you know, seen as strange. Um, so I would uh, take her in my arms and say, you're okay. <laughs> and it's going to be okay. It's going to be rocky. <laughs> uh, it's going to be a wild ride. Let me tell you that. But, um, but hold true to, to that. Cause I, you know, looking back at my life, I feel like that is, it is the most tenderest part of me. And also the part that I hold most precious and, and I guess that that is the aspect of myself that I am not willing to sell in the marketplace. And, and unfortunately, so much of my work comes, comes from that place. So it's all attached. So I, I don't know where the mark is. <laughs> you know, uh, um, I, can, I can paint. I can paint any subject. And, and I could probably make a really good living if I would do sunsets or just, you know, something, <laughs> something that everybody understands. But um I often just want to go into the um, esoteric and, um, you know, that's, it's, it's not uh, blockbuster material uh, generally, but. <laughs> but as you said, it will attract the right people and it is who you are. And for that, we are thankful because there is only one Constance Mears in the world. There is. <laughs> there is. And I don't, yeah, I, I guess one of the reasons I don't, you know, sell a package of, oh, follow me. is like, oh, I would not, you know, go follow in my footsteps. I, you know, I, I've, I've done a lot of the transformations organically, you know, not, not with mentorship, which, eh, you know, uh, that's a whole another podcast, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, so, you know, my advances are hard won, but I really, you know, I think when you, when you get those hard won, you know, that's the one thing is these folks selling programs and stuff, a lot of times they're, they're implying that they're going to give you a shortcut to save you, you know, years and years of mistakes or whatever. But I feel like every mistake, if you, if you really want to call it mistakes, I've learned something from those. And at, uh, you know, I, for me, it's the difference between moving uh, through a city in your car versus walking. Walking, you you are not moving so fast that you you can see uh, butterflies, which probably is not that you know compelling to other people. But uh, you, you can, but you can see what is appealing to you on a, on a really micro level, I guess. 
uh, and being present in the moment. I, I feel like we're on such a hurry to get to that pinnacle, whatever that, you know, um, idea of success is. We're such in a hurry. Oh, uh, you know, 30 under 30 or whatever. Uh, and, and, and that we revere prodigies and, and all that. But, you know, we get a long life and, and it's all part of life. All, I, I don't want to get to like a, plateau, you know, a peak and go, okay, I made it. And then I'm going to coast the rest of the way. <laughs> it's appealing, I guess, but um, I, I actually enjoy the discovery of, of, oh, I thought I wanted this. What was that about? What, what did I really want? You know, I thought I wanted this thing, but what was the, you know, the quality behind it that that I I felt somehow was missing in me that I wanted to 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 ingest it in some consume I guess and and all our consuming behavior I think is at some level wanting to fill something within us. That's the other thing is uh, at the times where I have made the most money. I have spent so much of that money consoling my soul <laughs> for not getting to do the thing that I really want to do. But, so for me, it's kind of a trade-off. Um, I, I think that's why a lot of people do go into debt is, um, you know, they want it so bad. And, and I get that, you know. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I, I just I support everyone and just living their their most authentic life whether that includes six figures or, or not or <laughs> and and no judgment if that's your thing i you know i have a best friend who wants to win the lottery she just wants to be filthy rich is what she says <laughs> so, yeah go play that game that's a fun that's an interesting you know realm to play in it's, it's like a big sandbox and, and you get to pick which or not sand play, playground and you get to pick whether you're in the sandbox or the swing or the slide or whatever Okay, now I've totally diverged off the question. <laughs> okay, on that note, um, we, I am conscious of the time, in fact, ticking yeah. by and all the living that needs to be done in the remaining time. So yeah. we are going to let you get to that. Um, okay. So thank you so much, Constance, for sharing all of our winding, adventurous explorations into the ideas and business stuff. I think it's been a really great look for people into other ways of doing things and the value of trusting yourself and feeling comfortable in the choices you've made and really owning that. Um, so thank you for opening up about all of those things and sharing that with us and your bravery in putting your story out there in such a beautiful package. There are links um, in the show notes to Constance's books and websites and art stuff and all of the things. Uh, she may not market herself, but I will market her for her uh, <laughs> benefits of being on the podcast. And I look forward to talking to you again soon. I always um, enjoy talking with you, Kristen. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome back. And we are gonna, I'm, I'm curious to hear what are your thoughts on that interview? I was there, so I got to see it firsthand, but I'm curious to know what did you think? Now I get to talk. Now you get to talk. So I have to say, uh, Crystal, um, Constance was the first person that uh, approached writing in a very uh, peculiar, fresh way, uh, different uh, from everything I thought. Um, it's an approach to writing that it's very inner based, right? So it, ju it just, uh, we were talking before offline about like something feeling more like a mysticism and religion and philosophy. It's all t attached together. When you listen to what she's saying, but also the way she moves, the way she sees at the works and at the world, it's very, very, very particular. And I found it useful because there are some, several things that she says, you have to listen to it twice in order to gather what's the message in. And there are pearls. There, there is uh, some of, of the things that I wrote that I had to write, uh, to read like a couple of times. And then I was like, wow, I didn't think about that that way. So there is one thing that I wanted to leave last, but I'm gonna tell you now. Uh, that uh, really made me stop. And uh, there is a, 
a sentence she says. I'm not sure if she forged this sentence or she took it from somewhere else. But she says, don't be a writer who needs readers. Be the kind of writer who readers need. And then made me pause for like 30 seconds and I was like, there is so much in these two sentences that probably in some, mo most of the books that I read about like self-help and uh, um, bettering your, yourself, it's just, it's so condensed. So I would say like all this interview, you have to really listen to what she says uh, to gather it. That's like what I thought. And that's why this thing that I'm saying it, it's point, point number 11 of my list of things that I wanted to say, but because it fits so well, I need, I need to say it like just right there. Did you like that uh, sentence? Yeah, I love that. That I, I mean, that's one of the things that I, that I, that I sort of believe as a mission statement is, you know, share what you think people need, and then they'll come find you. Uh, yeah. So yes, it was I like a, totally agree with that. It was like a like a punch in the face. You can say a punch in the face, but in a good way. <laughs> so it made you pause. But going back to the beginning. Um, she really starts the conversation from like a low place and then she kind of build up on the thing she said. So there is the way she started the conversation is by like kind of asking a question, uh, how to found like found like money wise also the creative endeavor. And now what nowadays with desktop publishing and stuff like this, she mentioned it's more easy than previously doing that. But so many things there are out there that distracts us you know, the Facebook society uh, or, or the Facebook economy also, if you want to. There are so many things and we discussed about these things a bit more uh, um, in previous episode. I'm thinking about Lysa's episode, like she was very good in saying that and how disconnecting yourself uh, from social could actually be one of the best things you can do for a limited amount of time for your writing career. She basically constants double that because she's really outside of that she doesn't use my understanding is that much um, social media even her website like she, it's used more like a, a business card i guess uh, from people that want to find her but it's really more an approach based on passion for what she's doing the why and she has a, a very strong sense of the why her why which is not something like that very many people have and you can say your why is wrong so she says, like, I don't want to make a six uh, figure income. Like, I'm not interested in that kind of thing. I'm more interested. My why is that my message is delivered to that person in a very, very genuine way. I can't say like my why or your why is better than hers. It's like, it's a very, it is a very particular way of seeing the world and her craft. So I would say that's basically the point from all of the, of the rest of, uh, of her philosophy, her mysticism, if you want, uh, takes place. That's, that's the point where all the conversations spawn afterward. There are another couple of things that she says that I found very useful. Um, and she says, are we moving people to a holy place, in a deeper place? Are we building fanatics? Now, the, the way she explain the concept of fanatics uh, is exactly how I expect a person like Constance would explain it to you. She explained the origin of the name. Remember like Crystal, right? It's like me, myself, I thought fanatics was something related to, I don't know, in the past, I know, but maybe not more than two or three centuries uh, in the past. But she's basically taking the root of the word and explaining why. And that made me think like, what she says of the people that in the past had to wait in a particular place before entering the shrine or the temple, whatever it was, it is emblematic. And at the same time, if I tell you, Krista Hunt, what do you think of fanatics? You would think of maybe a follower on Instagram or somebody that really likes your book. But the sense as Constance um, was trying to explain is much more deep. It's much more in line with what she thinks of the message. So I found that interesting. There are different things that you can think of with fanatics. You can think of him or her as um, the famous article, uh, uh, 1,000 true fans might be, or you can think as a fan, as a person that is reading your book and 
is transformed. Uh, so I found that uh, particularly useful. Um, and then there was like a shift, uh, an immediate shift when you ask her, why did you self publish? And that spawned uh, so many other things. Um, and I don't want to, uh, you know, to dig too much into that because like Constance was so, so good in explaining it. But there are just a couple of things that I want to say about that. Um, her way of self-publishing is in line with her why. Mm -hmm. Two of the things she said is, I want to be meaningful and I want to be authentic. That's paramount for her. Like she doesn't care that much about the money kind of things. And it's completely fine. We want to be like paid for our things. Like this podcast is called the Strategic Entrepreneur also because we want to create like a stream of revenue to this. But what she says is, uh, I think, profound in uh, a way that I found uh, written only in one other book, which is The War of Art uh, from uh, Stephen Pressfield. If you think about that, he says, uh, Stephen, exactly the same thing. Um, plant a seed, uh, do the work uh, you're supposed to do, build the legacy for your work. These are her words. This is something that also uh, Stephen was saying, and I was immediately when she she spoke about that authenticity meaning plant the seed do the work i was like this is exactly uh, the message that the other person was conveying and i was reminded remind, reminded of the fact of why i perceived it to be so powerful so uh, plant the seed uh, authenticity uh, and uh, the other thing that i wanted to point out was uh, when she related to the writing as uh, like creating a spell. Again, if you think about that mysticism, philosophy, it's all going uh, uh, nicely fitting. And she said, you can create reality through ideas. And uh, she got this idea from a, a, a quest, quest, I think she called in the mountains. Yeah. Uh, she did uh, several of these when she was 13, if I'm not mistaken, and later on. But it's true if you think about that. Writing is like uh, creating a spell. You can create reality through ideas. That's why people love, that's why people can get to love a person that doesn't exist, that is just in your mind. And um, you, uh, Crystal, as any other author that has been able to move people, um, people connect with uh, uh, authors that can deliver a message through uh, character and i think that was was exactly what she was meaning what she meant you have a really great superpower uh, you can bend reality you can change ideas and uh, you can write a romance uh, uh, serious novel that will make people question the way they are dealing with a partner like i'm sure 100 percent that you got email of people that were moved from what you said and even if you just give them a good time in that moment, you create a product that is just for entertainment. It relates to the fact of creating the spell. And you know a lot about creating spells, uh, Crystal, because your owner uh, is like a, like a witch on, on, on that sort. But if you think about her also as a character, she stuck uh, inside me. And she was, uh, I still remember her because like she was uh, compassionate. And she really, she really was trying to make the best out of, of, of her life. And she wanted to make the relationship with the other significant other that I'm not going to talk about because I, want, I don't want to spoil. But she wanted to make things right. So that's why I connected with, uh, with her so much. And I do believe that uh, Constance was uh, uh, mentioning that. The power of creating characters, uh, it's something we as an author, or as authors, have a deep responsibility of doing as best we can and again doesn't matter if we're doing that because we want uh, money in this sense you want something a bit more tangible or if you want to just be remembered or if you want uh, to make a person feel okay in that particular sense it's just important that you follow your calling and uh, i don't know what you came out uh, uh, from the conversation, but I think these three to four points uh, that I mentioned were the most significant for me. And I was very happy to listen to this, I'm saying peculiar, but I would say more like fresh approach to writing. What do you think? 
I think, um, do you know Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children? Do you know that book? No. Okay, so it's a, a YA book and it is sort of magical realism sort of uh, stuff, but peculiar can also mean special. Special, or okay. or different or whatever. So um, I think peculiar is actually a good word in that it, it's not an, a negative way. It's just in a different, and it's it stops and makes you think about things in a way that you maybe weren't. And I think it's very easy to get so wrapped up in the author business stuff. And when you start treating it as a business, which you need to, and that is good, but I think it is possible to lose sight of the readers. Like when you were talking earlier about the resource books that we read and all of the how-to stuff is all focused on what the author is doing and what you're pushing outward into the world. It's not focused on what you're drawing into you by the actions that you're taking. So I think that it's an interesting combination of the Strangers to Superfans book and Constance's interview where we're looking at, at the same thing. We're looking at how do we create a situation that invites people in and then makes fanatics of them, right? In a good way. So fanatic we talked about as the source of, or the root of the word fan, which we use now very commonly. But I think, you know, really that is what we're, doing i mean that is our ultimate goal is to create our our own tribe of fanatics and i think what you were mentioning around um the power we have to create create reality i mean we are word wizards it's what we do so we make we cast spells with our words we create new realities and possibilities and when we're talking about how does that impact people or what effect does that have on readers in terms of actually also rippling out into the real world, our characters can model change and growth in a way that people might not be able to see if it's too close to them. So when we're looking at a character who has been in a bad situation, they've maybe learned a certain way of dealing with something, current circumstances are challenging the beliefs they have about themselves and they are changing how they think changing how they act they're coming to some realization as they overcome the obstacles in the story that have them grow as people so i'm a health psychologist by background i worked as a counselor for many many years and it's an interesting opportunity that i look at my stories as a way of showing people they have options in how they stay or don't stay in relationships in how they choose to interact with people that they know and love and or hate and or don't understand and so i think for me that's where the power comes in and where i look to connect with the audience is that you you do as a storyteller have the option to affect change on the real world and i think looking at building your audience from that sort of magic -y point of view or mystical point of view, there is a certain magic that happens in, in the in-between space between you and that story and that story and the reader and, and the world that you all kind of live in together. Uh, there is a real magic there and there is a legacy to be left. You know, when I think of all the most important or memorable moments in my life, so many of them are connected to stories in some way, whether it's, you know, curled up with a, with my mom reading me a story or, you know, my, my grandma buying me my first Nancy Drew book for my eighth birthday or whatever it is. There's so many things that are tied to stories and, and stories that have changed the way I think about the world. And so I think, you know, it is extremely powerful and it is, something we need to be conscious of using our powers for good. If we're going to be word wizards, we need to cast the right kinds of spells on people. And, and I think it's really just a fabulous reminder that there, there are more than one way to do the things that we, we have a choice. We are people, we are authors, we are business owners, and we can choose to you know, stick with our ethics and stick with business methodologies that feel good to us. Because if we feel like we are authentic in our choices, as far as our business models go, and the way that we um, implement some of the tools and some of the processes that people recommend, that authenticity is going to be higher 
it's going to feel like us more. Our readers are going to make a more genuine connection. And that is going to both ripple out over time and it's going to make you less tired. Because when you are pretending or editing yourself or trying to be like somebody else instead of being like you, it's hard work. And it's, it's often not very comfortable and everything feels just a little bit off. And I, you know, to go back to the wizarding, I don't think you can cast a really good spell if things are off. You need all of the elements working together and you need all of that in alignment. So uh, I think it's really important to, yeah, just to be aware that you have choices. You can always take the best of what any opportunity has to offer and adjust things to fit what feels right for you. Um, and I think Constance is an excellent example of a way to do that. And no, your goal might not be making six figures. It doesn't mean you can't make money doing that. I think you, you absolutely can. And maybe you'll feel better about the money you are making if you are sticking with your values in your business. So I think that's, that's really, really important to consider is your why and how your what is going to support the why not compromise it okay so speaking of compromising <laughs> let's see what we can do in terms of damage with our curious jar today oh, not watching, not watching. Ah. hey <coughs> All right, tell me what to stop. Left there. There yes, something. there are still some left. But you should send us more. We would like more. So for all of the listeners out there, the curious jar is getting a bit low on questions. We need to refill it. So please send us in your ideas and you, sir, can tell me when to stop. Now. Yellow one. Okay. Dave's curious jar question. Oh, this is a fun one. Okay. How old were you when you first met someone who had written a book? Like met like personally? Yeah. Okay. So, um, I think I have the answer to that. I was 26 or 27. No, scratch that. 27 or 28. And uh, she was uh, Evangeline Lilly, which is one of the star of Lost. She wrote a kid's book, which I don't remember the name, but uh, she was presenting the book. She was the author of this book um, at uh, Indigo Robson. And when, when there still was the crystal, the very big Ro Robson Indigo, like three floor before they took it down, uh, I met her. Uh, and I spoke with her briefly, of course. And um, actually, like one of the, this is funny, <laughs> one of the characters in Omnilogos, which is my first science fiction book, uh, is called Evangeline because of basically her, <laughs> because I liked her, her char character in, uh, in uh, Lost. So that's weird. I, I didn't know, like, you see, you see this, these weird questions, like, make, me bubbling and suffering but this is a true story that's the first time i met uh, actually a celebrity and an author at the same time and it just happened a few years ago that's interesting i want to i want to hear about your experience like did you meet anybody yeah i was trying to think of when the first time i met an author was and i know i didn't know anybody who wrote books in school I, my grandma wrote a book actually. Um, and that was part of what got me into publishing. Um, and so that was an interesting start. I, I didn't meet any authors in college. Um, that wasn't a thing. I think it was probably, I joined Quill, which is the children's writers and illustrators of BC. And so I think probably the folks in Quill were the first authors that I met and they were all children's writers who had been published. And I, I may have actually published a book before I really met published authors, um, actually. But once I did, then I met a ton of published authors and I, I joined all the things and, and went all the places. I think, yeah, that was my, my introduction to most 
folks. But I do remember the first time I met an author who was on my own bookshelf that I'd had at home. And that was pretty memorable. Um, that was at the Surrey International Writers Conference, the which was actually the same year that I joined Quill. So it was a, a big year. I went from not knowing a single author to suddenly knowing <laughs> dozens and dozens and dozens of authors. But I met um, Jack White and Diana Gabaldon at the Surrey International Writers Conference. And both of them had their own shelf on my uh, bookshelf growing up. So I was very, very excited about that. And it seemed very surreal very very surreal so yeah there you go but I was the question I was 26 or 27 I think so we would love if you would tell us how old were you when you met your first author and what was that experience like if you drop by strategicauthorpreneur.com and check out this episode you will be able to post in the comments your story so we can get to know you a bit better and our jar is low on questions, as we mentioned. So if you can send a curious jar question to ideas at strategicauthorpreneur.com, then we'll add it to the mix for next week. And for show notes, links to resources we mentioned, and coupons and discounts on tools we love, visit us at strategicauthorpreneur.com. You can also subscribe to the newsletter and each week we will email you just one thing that we think will help you on your entrepreneur journey and a link to our latest episode. And if you leave us a review wherever you listen to this podcast, we'll give you a gold star and a million bonus points in the game of life. Thanks so much for taking time out of your busy life to get to know us and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on our next episode. And this is, or welcome to, the authorpreneur, uh, authors, strategic authorpreneur. Okay, <laughs> take again. Hi, I'm Constance Mears. Welcome to the strategic authorpreneur. Shit. <laughs> okay, you can, you can use that one because I know I'm not the only person who has problems with that word. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Nailed it. Okay. Did you record when you say to yourself that you were you had to talk slowly because like the the I, thing wasn't catch up? I don't know. That would be amazing. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, I need I need to talk slowly. Because, no, no, no. I was like, you don't. I, I understand that. Then I'm uh, English as a language, and you're like, no, it's not for you. It's because of the program. They can't catch up with me. That was that was amazing. Like. If you didn't record that, Crystal? I don't know. I think I hit record early, but I don't remember at which point. I never do. And I'm always <laughs> sad that I didn't. And then I go back and I have to do it again. But we honestly, we should pull some of the transcription phrases together because they're freaking hilarious. Why? Here is what, <laughs> here's what the transcript is. Yeah. Crystal. Hey there, strategic entrepreneurs. I'm Crystal Hunt. Mikhail. And I'm going to meet Ronnie Money Energy as you'll ever love your writing career. <laughs> All right, now can you see it? Oh, now I can see that son of a gun. Okay. Let go, let go. Oh, look at the time. Okay, let's go. Time's a wasting, life is short. Let's get to it. <laughs>